There's a lot of things I want to say, and I have a longer sermon, so I won't say a whole lot of them, but I am thankful in a way for so much of what I have been a part of and seen here in ministry at Scranton. I'm so thankful for the gospel choir that shared their gifts with us over the, the Christmas Eve and Christmas service. It blessed me greatly. I'm thankful for uh, everyone who serves, and I can't remember the number, but it's, an, it's a huge amount of people who serve every week here. And every week throughout the, the, the weeks that go by, I think of Francisco who was in the hospital this week and had uh, a ton of people visiting him. There were several people taking care of him. And, and that just made me feel so, so much, so good because I knew that's, that people were caring about each other here. And that's what we are. We're, we're a family that we got to care for each other. And, and that doesn't mean that family, you know, families, not everything's smooth all the time. But... But love of Christ draws us back together and back to each other every single time. And we got to be a church that does that. And so we're, we're starting a, a series today um, called A Faith for the Streets. And this is a, this is a series that we're going to be preaching through uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. And I, I just, I hear a lot of critiques of Christianity that, that Christianity is not, um, is not relevant to our lives. It's not relevant to the real world. To, to live a life of faith is, is not something that, that you can do. And there, there, there becomes this kind of mentality that my faith is for Sunday mornings, and I leave that there, and then my, my week, nothing else is connected to my faith. I know a lot of people that live that way. I know I lived that way for a long, long time. But our faith is connected to everything. The gospel is connected to everything. And through this series, my prayer is that you will see that, that I will see that as well, that we all see that together, how, how vital and how connected our, our faith, our, the gospel, is to the real world that we live in. Because ultimately, it's a picture of reality. And so my prayer is that we would, we would see that, we would, we would make note of that, and um, we're going to be preaching through all of Galatians. And so let's pray. I'll read the text, and then we will jump into it. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word, that you would guide us, that you would shape us through your word. Help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see you. Help us to know that this is a relevant and real thing that carries beyond just Sunday morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to start off in Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 24 today. It should be printed in your bulletin. I think you can follow it on the screen as well. Paul, an apostle, sent not from man nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, 
I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I had persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who has formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Perhaps one of the most radical conversions in all of the New Testament is the conversion of Paul. He was a Jew, but he, but he wasn't just any Jew. He was the Jew's Jew. He was a Pharisee. And if you remember back to the Gospels that, uh, that you read through, the Pharisees were one of the groups that opposed Jesus and the message that Jesus brought to the world. They were probably one of the main proponents to his teaching. And Paul was a preeminent Pharisee. He, he was the LeBron James or the Michael Jordan of all Pharisees. They were, I, I imagine people sat around talking about the, the who's who or the future Hall of Fame Pharisees. And Paul was always at the top of the list. And he knew that too. He was outstanding in the world of Judaism. He's the guy that, as Christianity spread, the Jews picked to hunt down and to destroy. He's the guy that we see in the beginning scenes of Acts where Stephen, the first Christian to die for his faith, or where he is preaching and, and he so enrages the Jews, they, they, they start stoning him and they're, they're throwing stones at him and they're around him and he can't get away and he's, he's stoned to death. And as he dies, he, he says, Lord, I commit my, my soul to you. And, and he says, please don't hold this, these sins against them. And in the background, we see Luke tells us, and Saul, which is Paul's government name, approved of their killing him. Paul had overseen the murder, righteous murder in his mind, but he'd overseen it nonetheless of Stephen. And then Acts 8, 2 through 3 tells us this. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul, Paul, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And then in Acts 9, we see that continue. Luke tells us that, that Paul was breathing murderous threats against the Christians. And that he'd gotten permission from the leadership to go to Damascus to arrest more Christians. To kind of follow where they were going. To, to track them down and, and take them into custody. He had a single-minded focus. He was going to destroy this faith. And the word got out that there was this guy who was persecuting them, who was chasing them down. They didn't even know him, but they feared him and what he brought. And then on his way to Damascus, Paul encounters Jesus. And his life changed. 
The shift is so radical that in the passages after Paul is converted, people have a hard time believing it. An early Christian by the name of Ananias asked the Lord in a, in a prayer, isn't this guy, this Paul, isn't he the one that's been trying to destroy us? And when Paul begins preaching about Jesus in Damascus, the people all ask each other, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet, Luke tells us in Acts 9 that Saul grew more, Paul, grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He goes from Jesus denier, Jesus community destroyer, to the defender of this new faith. He becomes one of the primary movers and shakers in the early growth of Christianity. He travels all over the Mediterranean. If you follow his travels in in Acts and all through his letters, he travels all over the Mediterranean preaching the gospel, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and starting churches everywhere. Everywhere he went, he started churches. He he found people who were either Jews or or Gentiles who were curious, and he preached the gospel, and, and there was conversions, and And churches started all over the place. And Galatians is a letter from this very same guy, Paul, to the churches that he started in the region of Galatia. It's churches that he started in earlier missionary trips and journeys. These are churches that are are fairly young in the faith. Many think that this may have been Paul's first letter or, or his earliest letter that we have. And these are, these are people who he, he, he keeps track of and he stays connected with and he knows and he loves and he cares about. And he wants to see them grow in their faith and, and he's, he's trying to stay as he travels as connected as possible. And so he writes them letters. And so when he writes to the churches in Galatia, they would have been churches that all over the region that would have gathered to hear these, these letters read. Pretend like we are a church in the, in the region of Galatia, Scranton Road. We would have gathered to hear this this letter that Paul had written. And somebody would would read it. Somebody that probably he sent would read it to the congregation. And then the congregation would find someone within it that that could write. And they would copy the letter. And they would send the original letter on to another church. But they would keep a copy of the one that they had. And Paul's letters would go through all these different churches all through the region. This same thing. Addressing the same thing that he had been hearing. Now, all of Paul's letters follow a, a really, a very similar format. Really, all, all letters written during this time period follow the same kind of, of format. It's what they learned when they went to their schools. It's like if you went to school before like 2005, I may get that right date, you learned how to write cursive. But after 2005, you don't learn that anymore. But that's what they, that's what they, that's not a, that's not a, I wish they wouldn't have made me learn cursive. I hated it. But, uh. But they taught them how to write letters, and they, and they followed a specific format. There would be an opening salutation where, where the person writing would say who it's from, who it's to, and then a, like a greeting. Our letter this morning starts that way. Paul, an apostle, who it's from, to the churches in Galatia who it's to, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, the greeting. The letter would be followed after the salutation by a prayer or a blessing or a thanksgiving. And this section would be where Paul would write how thankful he was for the church that he was writing to. Or, or he would ask God to give a blessing to the church or he would tell them how much they've blessed him. For example, in, in Romans 1.8, Paul writes this, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. And then after that would be the body of the letter, which is the meat of the thing that Paul's trying to say. It would be the main bulk of whatever letter you're reading from Paul. And then a final greeting and farewell, where Paul basically says, 
He gives a shout out to a bunch of different people. Romans 16 is probably the best example of it. It's long. It's the whole, pretty much the whole chapter where Paul says, oh, and say hi to Aquila and Priscilla. Say hi to, you know, Joe and, and Ted. And you get my point. Or he says, the people with me say hi to, to them. But it's a final farewell. And every single one of Paul's letters follows this format exactly. Except for three. There are three letters where Paul has the opening salutation, but then skips the thanksgiving or the blessing and jumps right into the meat of the letter. And those three letters, when Paul does that, it's because he's addressing some kind of heresy that robs the power of the gospel. And you guessed it, Galatians is one of those three that deviates. And so as we read the Bible, we look for those kinds of things to slow us down to say, okay, there's something important happening here. And that's the very same reason why Paul skips the thanksgiving or the blessing. It's because he he is jumping into something that's vitally important to him. And it's not just vitally important to him, it's it's vitally important to the church. Because they're getting off track. And we have to take real good, pay really good attention to this. He is so intent on what is happening that he wants to get to what's wrong. Paul, an apostle to the churches in Galatian, he greets them. And then no thanksgiving, no praise. Just the bold statement, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. That is the heart of the letter, really the heart of everything for Paul. And it's the one he's so concerned with, so passionate about, that he gets right to it. This one truth, that if the church in Galatia loses it, they've really lost everything. It's the one thing, the one truth, that if we lose it, then we lose everything. It has to underpin our whole life. The whole bedrock of Christianity is the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? In the New Testament, the word gospel is euangelion. It means good news. So the gospel is good news. It is news about something that has happened in the world. It isn't advice or instructions, or practical tips. Although all of those things can come out of the good news, that's not what the gospel is. It is news that is shared. And when you hear news, you respond, or not. You're faced with something that has happened in the world, and then you have a decision about how you're going to respond. I used to be a state trooper in Virginia, and one of the things that we had to do on a routine routine basis is death notifications. And it's where you go to somebody's house and you tell them that a loved one or someone within their household has died. That's news. That's really bad, bad news. But when somebody is faced with that, they have to respond. I've seen people cry. People faint. People become violently sick. People become violent and combative. People not believe it. But all of those things are a response to news, to something that has already happened. And they choose how they're going to respond. The gospel is news of something that has happened in the world. Something good. Something great. That we have to contend with. We're forced to deal with the reality of it. It's good news. Well, what's the news? Paul gives that to us at the very opening of the letter in verses 3 through 4. 
He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. It tells us three things. That we are sinners. That we need rescue. And that it happens at, at the will of the Father. We are sinners. All people are sinners. We, we like to cover those kinds of things. But the fact is, the biblical account tells us that we're all sinners. And we live in a society that really doesn't like to admit that. We like to polish our self-image. We kind of airbrush our lives so that all the dirty stuff is hidden and all the good stuff looks, you know, vibrant and, and real. We, we downplay our history. Some of the most powerful testimonies are when people are real about their, their history, their past. Rebecca McGoffin says it best in a Twitter dust-up she had on a few years ago. And, it, it was, and I've used it before because I liked it so much. But people were saying really nasty things about her. And rather than defending herself and like promoting all the good things she was doing, she says this, For those calling me a liar this morning, you're right. I've lied plenty of times in my life. So I deserve the term. Though truth be told, I sin far more frequently in other ways. Have you ever been in a fight where you, just, where you said the people that were saying things about you were right and then just piled on yourself? And then she says, if you're interested, I'm also a hypocrite, a coward, an adulterer, according to Jesus' standards in Matthew 5, 28, a gospel, and a racist. Thank God he sent Jesus to die for sinners like me. And then she said, because she left a, like a little blank unintentionally and so people were hamming her for her grammar and she says just noticed i accidentally left a blank in the list but i'm leaving it there so you can fill it in with all my other areas of sin you're welcome so this is somebody who understands herself and is not not willing to like push it aside and, and airbrush it but owns it because she understands some other things She understands that we're all sinners and that we all need rescue. And that's why Jesus came. You see, we're helpless in the grips of, a, of an evil age. Of a horrible age, as Paul said. An evil, wicked age. So much is broken in the world. You, it isn't hard to look around and see the brokenness in the world. To see pain and suffering and death. They all seem to reign supreme. And we need lifted out of it all. We are powerless to save ourselves. If you are in a pool drowning, you need a lifeguard to jump in the water to save you. If you are not drowning, then you are swimming and you don't need rescue. But we need rescue. I think the most clear proof of our need for rescue is the fact of death itself. We all will die. We don't escape that. Every human is faced with that in, in their life. If you live, you will die. No one that I know of ever has been able to escape that through their own power. But we are told in the Bible that we can actually avoid that, that we can find eternal life. One of the results of being under the power of this evil age is that we face death, that we decay. But John 3, 1 John 3 says that we have passed from death to life. In Jesus, the passage above my shoulder, Romans 6.23, says that we have all sinned, or the wages of sin is death, but the, that's another one, but the gift of God is eternal life. No one ever in the history of, of the world has ever saved themselves from death. We need at least that. And the third thing is that God has willed our rescue. From start to finish, his will, his motivation, his work is what saves us. We were in our sins, trapped and needing rescue, powerless to save ourselves. And Christ Jesus 
has accomplished our salvation. And we're rescued when we have faith in the one who rescues us. This has a lot of implications for life. And we're going to be looking at that over the next few weeks. Implications that are powerful. But we have to really make this clear today because the attack in Galatia is first and foremost an attack on the good news. There are people coming in to pervert the news, changing it, saying something that isn't true. The thing about news is that it matters. How many times have we heard of the last seven years fake news? Because fake news is really no news at all. It doesn't, it's not helpful. It's made up stories. So it matters. News matters. The good news matters. And if we hear news that's been sh shifted or changed or altered, then it's no kind of news at all. And our life is built on lies. And there are those who have become into Galatia and they're starting to shift the news. They're starting to change it. They're changing the whole meaning of the gospel and they're throwing people into confusion. But Paul says that those people are under God's curse, that they are condemned. No matter who they are or whether they're an angel or Paul himself, if they preach news other than what the people accepted originally, then they are under God's curse. Anything added to or taken away from the gospel, the good news, should be rejected. We are sinners. We need rescued. And we can't do it ourselves. God does the rescuing. Sinners saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There are a couple ways that this is perverted in Galatia. And we're going to look at those in more detail in coming weeks. But I want to hit those real quick. The two major ways that the gospel can be perverted is that it can be added onto or it can be taken away from. Adding to the gospel, and, and this is what a lot of churches fall into, and this is what the, the, the Galatian churches are falling into. It says that you are saved by faith and something else. You are saved by faith and good works. For those churches in Galatia, it's believing that Jesus saved them, plus observing some of the Jewish rituals and practices and customs. These types of churches are, are marked by uh, intolerance of small differences of custom and dress and rituals and traditions. Whenever someone tells me that a true Christian or a real Christian has to do something a certain way, my alarm starts to go off because this may be an indication that they're adding something to the gospel. This is a danger in churches. It's, it's a danger for all of us personally in our own lives. It's a danger in churches. But there's a far more subtle version of this that I think probably has a lot more effect on people and is more insidious. And here's what it looks like. It's when people begin to believe that they have to maintain a special level of spiritual piety in order to be saved. They believe that they have to reach a special level of faith. Tim Keller says this, There are people who feel that they must generate a high degree of spiritual sorrow, hunger, and love in order to get Christ's presence. Then they must somehow maintain this if they're going to stay saved. But the gospel says that we are saved through our faith. It isn't through our level of faith. It's, it's not through a higher level of faith, but the object of our faith that saves us. And that's Jesus. The other way that the gospel is perverted is subtracting from the good news. And the most common way that this is done is by saying, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're a good person. As long as you're a loving or kind or good person, that's all that really matters. It removes the idea that we need rescue by telling us that we can save ourselves by being good. This view teaches that all people can find God regardless of their religion if they're just good enough. And it removes the idea of our needing to be rescued. 
And it sounds good and open-minded. And in a culture like that, where it sounds so close-minded to say that Jesus is the only way, this is an error that can be easy to, to, to move into. It actually seems to be more full of grace, but it's really antithetical to grace. Because to say good people can come to God excludes bad people. Which means bad people have no hope. Which means if you've ever been bad, then you have no hope. If you've ever, like Rebecca McLaughlin says, lied or done any of those things, then there is no hope. And the second thing this does is that it teaches people that they can get eternal life for themselves and they don't need God's help. Jesus' death means nothing. They can be their own savior and the glory is shifted from God onto themselves. And they lose sight of their own sinfulness and their own evil and the knowledge of God's grace won't be transforming. But to cling to the gospel that we are sinful and wicked beyond our wildest imagination, but in Christ, in Christ alone, we are more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope, destroys those errors. And that's what Paul is so concerned with. But why should we believe Paul? Why should the Galatians believe Paul? Because what he passes on isn't something that he has come to through meditation or theological reflection or a book he's read or a person he's talked to it is something that has been given to him as a bedrock of truth for life directly from jesus christ this is a big deal in verse one paul starts the letter off by writing paul an apostle sent not from men nor by man but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And then verse 11 and 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. This is something that has been given directly to him by Jesus. It is direct from Jesus. Apostle means one who is sent. And in the church, there's always been a distinction between big A apostles and little a apostles. The big A apostles, like Paul, are those with a mandate and a sentness directly from Jesus Christ. And their words carry the same weight. We call this the word of God. Even though we know that Paul wrote a good portion of it. John Stott, in a short little pamphlet on biblical authority, says that when we read the words of Paul, we read the very words of Jesus Christ. And so this is from Jesus, not man. Not wishful thinking, but from Jesus. And it is what so radically changed Paul. You see, he was striving to please God. He was working as hard as he possibly could to please God, to do all the right things. And he was doing the exact opposite. Until he encountered Jesus, who radically changed the way he saw the world and it shifted everything so paul knows how vital and how important this is to the church in galatia the church in corinth the church in philippi the church in cleveland it is so vital and important We can, we can talk about a million practical things that will help us in life. We can talk about a, a million life hacks that will make us uh, live life like champions. But if we lose this thing, then none of that matters. The foundation of having a, a faith for the streets is this bit 
of truth. Everything in the world is opposed to it. It doesn't make sense. It isn't logical. Everything in the world is... All of our lives are lived in a way counter to that. We just got done celebrating a holiday, which is my favorite holiday in the world. I'm not picking on it. But part of the holiday is that we teach that Santa Claus is coming to town. And if you are good, you earn gifts. And if you're bad, you don't. Which is the exact opposite of the gospel. Is that God finds us in our naughtiness and has mercy on us. Now don't come at me, I'm not poo-pooing Santa Claus. But that's just, and that's the holiday we celebrate the birth of Jesus who came to bring God's grace and mercy into the world, right? That's crazy. But that's how the world, the world is, it attacks that, that truth. Because if that, is, if that is attacked and broken down, then everything else it unravels. So here's the practical piece for today, and I'm, I'm, I'm ending. This is the practical piece for today. In life, if you are a Christian, you're going to fail. And your first reaction will be to try harder, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, to, to do better next time. And that's not a bad impulse. But Paul says, don't lose the gospel. Don't add anything or take anything from the gospel. Don't desert the one who called you. The gospel isn't just news for conversion. It isn't just for non-believers and once you're saved you pass on to, now you have to try really hard to do better and, and be approved by God. The gospel is this, a better way of thinking about it is this. We are saved by believing the good news that saves us about Jesus Christ and then we are transformed in every part of our life, our minds, our hearts, our wills. By believing the gospel more and more and more. If you aren't a Christian, you have a decision to make. The good news is there. It's there. It's historical. It's happened. How do you respond? That's for you to decide, to think through. If you're already a Christian... Seek to have your lives transformed in every part of your mind, your heart, by believing the gospel more and more deeply as life goes on. It's the only way forward. Pray with me. Lord, I pray that you would help us to sink this truth deep. We are starting to unpack it in just this first chapter of Galatians, but Paul goes so much deeper and so much further throughout the rest of this letter. I pray that you will guide us through this. Help us as we read it to see your truth. Help us as we hear it to hear your truth, Lord. I pray that you would break our hearts open for how powerful this is and how much it transforms personally our lives, communally our lives as a church, and in the city and the world. Because it, it does. Lord, I pray that you would sink that deep, that we would carry it with us from here, into the streets, wherever we go. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.